Depending on which day of the week you look at the stock market, the chances are that one of these two will be the richest human being on the planet. They are, of course, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. Both of them made their fortunes providing products and services that were simply too useful and too convenient for people to ignore. And the behemoth corporations of Microsoft and Amazon have come to epitomise the principles of mass market capitalism and ever-increasing levels of consumption. But of course, with great wealth comes great responsibility. Over the last 20 years or so, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has given away almost $40 billion in philanthropic donations, mostly focused on improving health and education in developing countries. And in February 2020, Jeff Bezos took to Instagram to announce that he will be committing $10 billion of his personal fortune into the launch of his own philanthropic organisation, which he's calling the Bezos Earth Fund. These are enormous sums of money from enormous fortunes. So how do the activities and contributions of these two men and the companies they founded measure up to each other when it comes to our most urgent predicament, the climate emergency? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Let's just say that give or take a couple of billion either way, these two guys are pretty much the two wealthiest people in the world. They both agree that climate change is real and that it represents a clear and present threat to life on Earth. They also agree that human-induced emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are the main driver of atmospheric warming and climate change. And they both recognise that urgent action is needed in order to reverse those emissions and dramatically slow that warming. In his Instagram post back in February, Jeff Bezos told us climate change is the biggest threat to our planet. I want to work alongside others both to amplify known ways and to explore new ways of fighting the devastating impact of climate change on this planet we all share. This global initiative will fund scientists, activists, NGOs, any effort that offers a real possibility to help preserve and protect the natural world. And back in his 2015 annual letter, Bill Gates said this, the long-term threat of climate change is so serious that the world needs to move much more aggressively right now to develop energy sources that are cheaper, can deliver on demand and emit zero carbon dioxide. The next 15 years are a pivotal time when these energy sources need to be developed so that they'll be ready to deploy before the effects of climate change become severe. In fact, Bill Gates has been campaigning on climate change issues for over a decade now. Back in 2010, he gave a presentation called Innovating to Zero as part of the TED 2010 event, focusing on the five technologies that he saw as key to achieving an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. Gates introduced this simple equation to illustrate the main drivers of CO2 emissions. P stands for population, S is services per person, E is the energy consumed per service, and C is the CO2 emitted per unit of energy consumed. Bill's point was that for the world to get anywhere close to net zero carbon emissions, basic algebra said that one of the numbers on the right hand side would also have to get very close to zero too. It was unlikely to be population, he argued, because that was set to rise from the 6.8 billion people that were on the planet in 2010 to over 9 billion in 2050. And it was even less likely to be services, which he said encompassed everything from food to clothing to electrical appliances to heating and fuel. Because as the developing world continued to pull itself out of poverty, Gates pointed out that all of those services would go up, not down. In fact, he told his audience that those things were predicted to double by 2050. Energy efficiency offered a ray of hope even back in 2010 with great advances already being made in energy saving light bulbs, improved building and insulating materials and better fuel efficiency in vehicles. But Gates suggested that those kinds of initiatives might at best halve the emissions that our species produced. So that left the blindingly obvious conclusion that the world had to find a way to bring the level of carbon dioxide emissions from energy generation right down very close to zero. And if we were going to achieve an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050, which was the United Nations stated aim back in 2010, then Bill showed us that our trajectory would have to take us towards a 20% reduction by 2020. Well, 2020 has of course arrived, and it may not surprise you to learn that we haven't achieved that goal. In the year that Bill Gates delivered that TED talk a decade ago, according to the International Energy Agency, human energy related CO2 emissions totaled about 30 billion tonnes. By 2019, that figure had actually gone up to just over 33 billion tonnes. 
The scientific consensus is that as a result of these emissions increases, we've now missed our opportunity to simply reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we emit. We now need to start finding ways to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere at the same time as rapidly reducing the amount we emit in the first place so that we reach a net negative number during the second half of this century. So how do Gates and Bezos, and for that matter Amazon and Microsoft, stack up against that ambition? Well, in 2014 Gates stepped down as chairman of Microsoft, but the company he founded nearly 40 years earlier had by then already committed itself to a net carbon zero future. In that same year, the US Environmental Protection Agency listed Microsoft as number two in the top 100 leading green energy purchases in the States, with the company purchasing almost 2.7 billion kilowatt hours of clean energy on an annual basis. Unsurprisingly, Apple were also right up there in the top five, but Amazon didn't appear in the list at all. In fact, Bezos's company has been one of the slowest of all the so-called new tech giants to respond to the climate challenge. And even today, there's a great deal of skepticism about the motives behind Amazon's environmental position and accusations of hypocrisy from environmental groups like Greenpeace, who highlight completely contradictory activities that the company is engaged in. According to a 2019 article by Brian Merchant for Gizmodo.com, Amazon's announcement of a drive towards 100% renewable energy came more than two years later than Microsoft, Apple, Facebook and Google, and under great pressure from consumers and environmental groups. Despite making good progress in its first two years, in 2016 the renewable energy program at Amazon suddenly stopped. The following year, at Amazon's annual web services sales event, one of the key presentations ran under the heading Positioning for Success in Oil and Gas. Since then, says the Gizmodo article, Amazon has aggressively courted the fossil fuels industry, landing deals and partnerships with companies like BP, Shell and Halliburton, offering database services such as machine learning for enhanced exploration, oil field automation and remote site data transportation. By contrast, Microsoft, under the leadership of CEO Satya Nadella, and with Gates still on the board as a technical advisor, has continued to build on its renewable energy commitment. And in January of 2020, the company announced the astonishingly ambitious commitment that by 2050, it will have removed from the atmosphere the equivalent of all the carbon dioxide it has ever emitted since its inception in 1975, with the aim of becoming carbon negative by 2030. And that does indeed mean that it plans to draw down more atmospheric carbon dioxide than it emits. Outside of Microsoft, in February of 2020, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced that it'll be expanding its philanthropic portfolio to enable Melinda to focus on gender equality and Bill to pursue all possible climate change mitigation initiatives. That move builds on personal investments that Gates has already built up over several years, most notably as part of a consortium called the Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund, or BEV. Gates launched the fund in December 2016 along with fellow directors Jack Ma, who's the founder of Alibaba, Mukesh Ambani of Reliance Industries, venture capitalists John Doerr and Vinod Kosler, energy hedge fund manager John Arnold, and SAP co-founder Hasso Plattner. And in news that attracted great fanfare and more than a few ironically raised eyebrows, one of the 20 or so other billionaire investors who joined the fund in its first year was none other than Jeff Bezos himself. According to this Business Insider report, part of BEV's mission is to provide patient capital. And that means BEV is willing to forego returns on investments for up to 20 years to give the scientists and engineers at startups a reasonable lead time to develop their technologies. As billionaires, the article points out, these guys can afford to wait a long time for their return. But to be eligible for BEV's money, the startups have to demonstrate viable technology that has the capacity to reduce annual global greenhouse gas emissions by at least 500 million metric tonnes. One of the more encouraging aspects of the BEV fund is a significant focus not just on energy technologies, but also on agricultural solutions, a focus almost certainly driven by the knowledge and experience Gates has garnered through the philanthropic work of his own foundation. In his Gates Notes blog from March 2019, Bill quite rightly highlights the fact that electricity generation accounts for only about 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions and that a very significant reduction can be achieved through improvements in agricultural practices. He points out that there's more carbon in soil than there is in the entire atmosphere and all plant life combined. And when that soil gets disturbed, like it does when a forest is converted into cropland, 
all that stored carbon gets released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Deforestation alone, says Gates, is responsible for 11% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And as soil microbes come into contact with the prodigious volumes of modern synthetic fertilizers now being flooded into the ground all over the planet, they release huge quantities of the very powerful greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. So as part of its 2019 funding program, the BEV Fund invested in six startups that are developing solutions that can significantly improve the way the world produces food. Pivot Bio have developed a gene-edited bacteria that produces nitrogen. The company's initial tests show that it could produce more bushels per acre of corn than chemical fertilizer, even under different weather conditions and in different soil types. If used on 30 million acres of land, Pivot Bio's products could prevent 20,000 metric tonnes of nitrous oxide emissions, and that's the equivalent of taking 1.5 million cars off the road. Appeals Innovation is a plant-based coating that can be applied to fruits and vegetables, while another startup called Cambridge Crops has developed a similar coating made of water and silk that can be used on foods including seafood, meat and produce. Both companies aim to eliminate food waste and the need for food packaging, which in turn reduces greenhouse gas emissions and conserves precious water supplies. The fourth startup, a company called Kernza, has created a new strain of wheat that absorbs more carbon dioxide from the soil than the standard crop. The company's strain also lives for more than two years as opposed to the single growing season for normal wheat, all of which results in greater yields for the farmers and more food for consumers. Startup number five is called C16 Biosciences. They've created a technology that ferments palm oil in the same way as beer. Palm oil is of course big news nowadays. It's used in all sorts of foods like chocolate, bread, margarine and pizza dough, as well as a whole host of other everyday products including shampoo, detergent, lipstick and even diesel fuel. But to clear the way for palm oil plantations, companies have had to resort to deforestation, causing 11% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. C16's innovation would drastically reduce this catastrophic activity. Unlike the other five startups, the final company called Babangona doesn't rely on advanced technology. Instead, it's solving a problem for farmers in Nigeria who lack a place to store their crops. By providing shared facilities for farmers, the company allows them to wait until the market is hot to sell their goods. This helps cut back on food waste and improves local incomes. If the world reduced just half of its food waste by 2050, it could cut back on more than 70 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions. Now, I can almost hear some of you shouting at the screen that Gates and his mates could simply invest the entire billion dollars in regenerative agriculture and other natural solutions like biochar. You may well be right, of course, and no doubt we'll be looking at those solutions in ever-increasing detail in future episodes as their efficacy and importance becomes more apparent to the mainstream investors. In the meantime though, what about Jeff's own personal venture then, this Bezos Earth Fund? Well, even for a man worth around $120 billion, offering up $10 billion of your own money is a significant commitment and Bezos surely deserves credit for that. But the slow pace of movement towards sustainability at Amazon, coupled with the arguably hypocritical way they're offering their data services to fossil fuel companies, has inevitably caused more scepticism in the press. Add to that an almost complete lack of detail on how the Bezos Earth Fund is to be administered, and the result is a spate of responses like this one from Teddy Schleifer at Vox, which poses some questions that he says need to be answered before a proper assessment can be made. Schleifer questions whether the money will be made available in its entirety as a robust response to the massive urgency of the climate crisis, or dribbled out at, say, 5% per annum, as is the standard practice for many existing legacy funds. If it's the former, then it may well prove to be of great benefit. But if it's the latter, then it could turn into little more than a vanity project for poor old Jeff, a bit like his bonkers plan for package tours to Mars. Other questions also remain unanswered, like whether any funds will be used for political advocacy, who will control the fund and make decisions on grants, and what will the legal status of the fund be? Depending on how it's set up, it could either be a very effective vehicle for enhancing tax breaks to facilitate more investment in the right technologies, or just another massive tax dodge for Bezos and Amazon. No doubt all of this will be clarified before the first grants begin to go out in the summer, but Schleifer makes the point that it's not unreasonable to expect answers to these questions right at the get-go when the initial announcement was made. Bezos got a lot of positive PR from this February Instagram post, 
and Schleifer suggests that there should be some sort of transparency for the consumers who ultimately fund these programs. He argues that philanthropy at this scale and with this mission is no longer a personal matter that's none of our business. It affects all of us and deserves our scrutiny. So what's your view on the whole climate philanthropy thing? Is it a genuine force for change that could contribute towards the survival of our species? Or just a clever way to siphon off massive tax-free company profits? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. That's it for this week though. A massive thank you as always to the channel supporters over at Patreon who make these programs possible. If you'd like to get more involved with the channel and have your say in monthly content polls, then you can do that by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can show your support for the channel for free by hitting the like button and by subscribing, both of which massively help to get our message to more and more people each week. It's dead easy to subscribe. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notified about new content. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.